All right, guys, welcome back. We're up to topic 4.11 of the APUSH curriculum titled An Age of Reform. And uh, this is a great connection back to our last video on the Second Great Awakening. Um, if people are feeling uh, religious, they're looking to, of course, clean up some problems in America. And that is going to be the topic of this, to of this topic, An Age of Reform. So what, what are the causes and effects of those major reform movements? Let's get into those. So um, let's think back to the Second Great Awakening, our last topic. This was, of course, this time period where people are trying to create a better world through faith. Um, we're fighting back against earthly evils. We're trying to create uh, almost like a heaven on earth. And we also learn that middle class women were the ones leading the charge in the Second Great Awakening. And so if you're going to try to create a better earth through faith, you've got to fix the problems. So we're going to go through some of these uh, these reform movements. And the first one is called the Temperance Movement. And the Temperance Movement, of course, is a pushback against alcohol consumption. Now, if you think Americans drink a lot of alcohol today, we have nothing on the people of the first half of the 1800s. Americans were drinking themselves stupid. I mean, just tons and tons of alcohol consumption, which led to all kinds of problems. You know, you, uh, especially if you're thinking about these new factory jobs where you're working long hours and takes concentration on these dangerous machines and you're half drunk in the process, that's not good. So work is going to be more dangerous. Uh, the family itself is going to be endangered by unruly husbands who stagger home at the end of the day um, and are angry at the world and they sometimes take it out on their family. And of course, alcohol itself is something that comes to dominate people's lives more so than their religions. So their own spiritual welfare is at stake. So the temperance movement is this idea that we need to fix it. Uh, we need to fix it before it gets too late, right? So this is the famous, the drunkard's progress where this guy, he takes, a, takes just one glass, right? A glass to the friend. And it progresses to the point where he becomes this raging alcoholic whose life is dominated by drink and eventually uh, leads to his death. And the family is left behind to suffer. So it's a good example of a, a reform effort to clean up this problem, we can point to the American Temperance Society that was formed in 1826 in Boston. Uh, there will be over a thousand groups across America that will be inspired by this original branch. And the point of this is to encourage drinkers to take a temperance pledge, to, to sign a pledge that they will not drink to excess any longer. Now, obviously, I'm sure many of these people signed and then turned right around and had a drink. But you know, I'm sure it had an effect, positive effect on some who eventually realized, oh my gosh, you know, my life is being ruined by alcohol. I need to take this a little bit more seriously. All right, our next big um, reform movement is something we're going to refer to as prison reform. So the you know legal punishments were pretty severe back in this time period. Uh, capital offenses went beyond just murder. Uh, there are all kinds of crimes that you could commit that, would, that could potentially result in your death. And the prisons themselves were deplorable places where people were abused and lived in just horrible conditions, were tortured. And so we need to clean up the prisons. The idea, this new idea is that prisons should be more than just a punishment. It should be a t an attempt at reforming these people so that they will... Um, you know, come out of prison a better person and learn how to fit into society better. Now, of course, we can look at this, I think, and think, well, gosh, that's pretty naive. That's never going to work. And I don't know that we are ever going to get to that point, but it's an ideal. And, you know, the Second Great Awakening in this time period is full of idealism that we can, in fact, achieve a better way of doing things. All right, our next reform movement is going to be asylum reform. Um, asylums were basically, well, let me back up. So think about mental illness in, in the early 20th, 21st century, like we're living in. Uh, it is something that's far more accepted and understood, but even so, there's still a lot we don't know about it. So contrast that with 200 years ago. Mental illness was something that people just didn't understand at all. A lot of people thought these people were willfully, um, 
degenerate and were, you know, basically it was their fault that they were losing their uh, control on themselves and these people need to be punished or at least isolated. Um, asylums were places where patients, if you want to call them that, uh, were often locked away like prisoners, sometimes chained down, uh, sometimes beaten and tortured. It was absolutely awful. And so into this environment steps a woman named Dorothea Dix. And Dorothea Dix was given a task um, by the Massachusetts legislature to, to basically uh, develop a report on what she saw in these, re in, these in these asylums. So she spent about eight years traveling um, all around, looking in these asylums, seeing the conditions there, and just absolutely blown away by how awful it was. Um, and so she publishes publishes this report, and it really opens a lot of people's eyes. And they're thinking, "Oh my gosh, I can't believe this is happening behind closed doors. We've got to do something about this." And so that begins the process of trying to gain better treatment, and also just a better understanding, acceptance of people who have mental illness issues. Um, that you know they shouldn't necessarily be just chained up and locked away in a dungeon. They you know we can help these people. And uh, we don't have to be afraid of them. All right, our next big reform movement is education reform. So think about how schools were different back then. Schools tended to be uh, much more informal. Uh, attendance was kind of come and go. The school year itself was sporadic. Um, supplies were lacking. Teachers often had very little training, if any training at all. It was just kind of a mess. And so into this steps a guy from Massachusetts named Horace Mann. And Horace Mann uh, pushed Massachusetts to uh, change how they did schooling. We're going to make attendance compulsory. In other words, you had to go. Um, we're also going to uh, make the school year longer and have a more standardized calendar. We're going to have better uh, training for our teachers, better textbooks and supplies for our students. And uh, his opinion was that America really can't succeed unless our young are getting a good education, that the future of America really is at stake in our schools. Now, going along with that is another person we're going to look at named William McGuffey. Uh, William McGuffey is famous for his McGuffey readers. And a McGuffey reader is basically a textbook that uh, teaches reading and literacy, but also infuses its students with moral education. So you would you would learn how to read by reading stories, and as you read the stories, um, you would also learn what it is to be a good citizen, to be a punctual, hardworking, serious, you know, uh, upstanding American. So it's a little, it's you know, it's it's part shaping the American character, but it's also teaching kids how to read. Uh, these sold, I mean, in the tens of millions. So this was. Uh, for for generations, the source of a lot of Americans' uh, first reading was through McGuffey readers. Here's a, a a page from a McGuffey reader, for example. All right, now let's talk a little bit about abolitionism and um, talk about how it's changing and shifting and, and also um, what the future is going to look like as we head on to the Civil War. So this is a, a good example of... That, that sort of regional um, break in the, the view of slavery. So you'll notice anti-slavery petitions to Congress, and you'll also notice uh, how in some states it's overwhelmingly male, and in other states it's overwhelmingly female. Uh, but you see, again, just hundreds and then also thousands of these petitions being sent to Congress to do something about slavery. So there's a huge demand in the North. However, I want you to think, if... The North was successful in ending slavery in the South. Would they have welcomed these former slaves with open arms? And the answer, of course, is, well, not most of them, right? Most of the North would not have done so. So the question was, what do we do? If, if slavery does end, what happens to the slaves? Do we, do we accept them in as uh, full American citizens or not? And so this gives birth to something called the Back to Africa movement. And this is a topic we're going to um, kind of revisit here and there, even as late as the 20th century, this idea that perhaps African Americans would be better served by going to Africa as opposed to staying in America. 
Uh, so examples of that belief would be the 1817 American Colonization Society, um, who established the Republic of Liberia in West Africa. Um, the idea being that, you know, uh, liberated slaves from America can go to Africa. Now, stop and think about this for a moment. Is this actually a, a great idea? And if you think, uh, your, most slaves in America had been living in America for generations at this point. They have no, um, uh, you know, connection to Africa other than their ancestry. They don't, they've never been there. Uh, they don't speak the native languages in the part of Africa they'd be sent back to. So this would be, I don't know how effective this truly would have been. Um, the first president of Liberia was an American, a free black man from the South, from Virginia, named Joseph Jenkins Roberts. And of course, Liberia is still an independent country today. And there are, uh, it's a minority, but there are some uh, people who live in Liberia today who can definitely trace their ancestry back to American slavery. Now, let's look at uh, a couple of abolitionists. Uh, the first is a guy named William Lloyd Garrison. You've probably heard of him. Um, he published a newspaper called The Liberator, and The Liberator was an unflinching, uncompromising, outspoken, and direct appeal to end slavery. It was not talking about, hey, let's do this, you know, let's, let's maybe end it here, but not there. Let's compromise this. No, we're going to end slavery now, um, and let's do it. Um, he was a very driven individual, William Lloyd Garrison was. He establishes in 1833 the American Anti-Slavery Society, which will be um, probably the most prominent of these abolitionists' uh, um, groups that publish uh, literature and send out speakers and try to convince the North that they need to uh, push back against slavery in the South. Now, William Lloyd Garrison um, obviously was a very serious individual who's very seriously committed to abolitionism, but he doesn't have the life experience that many of the black abolitionists do. Uh, Sojourner Truth was a good example of someone who could speak on the topic of slavery from a very personal place. She had escaped slavery age 29, and she goes on to be a very powerful speaker, not just for abolitionism, but for women's rights as well. And, uh, you know, her message was powerful because it came from a place where it was very authentic. I mean, her story was real and dramatic, and she could tell you about it, uh, not in an abstract way as to why slavery is wrong, like William Lloyd Garrison, but like a very specific way. Uh, this is what happened to me. Uh, on the same lines of that would be, of course, Frederick Douglass, arguably the most famous abolitionist of all time. He had escaped from slavery in Maryland at age 21. Um, uh, he goes on to become a, a, a world-renowned speaker and writer on the topic of abolitionism. And in 1845, he publishes his autobiography, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, which really opens people's eyes, not just the evil of slavery, but also the fact that this man is writing so eloquently is a total rejection of this idea that black Americans are somehow um, not as capable of learning as white Americans. You know, he is he's a living rejection of that uh, white supremacy model that was so practiced in this time period. Oh, another random thing here about um, uh, about uh, Frederick Douglass. He's also the most photographed man of his era. He sat for dozens of portraits um, over the course of his life, which I find pretty interesting. All right, now let's move on to women's rights a little bit and talk about um, what women are, you know, what challenges they're facing, but also what accomplishments they're they're achieving. So let's think about those challenges. What are some challenges that are in the way of women trying to gain more rights? And women had all kinds of obstacles in their way, right? They can't vote. Uh, in many places, they have few, if any, property rights. Uh, in many places, schooling was not an option, at least, you know, all the way through a high school or college or something like that. And uh, women could be uh, violently... Um, treated by their by their husband and uh, the, the government was rarely going to step in and prevent that so women have all kinds of obstacles nonetheless uh, we do see the um, 
the the rising of some pretty big names here in in terms of women pushing for equality and better rights for women uh, names like lucretia mott susan b anthony and elizabeth katie stanton come to mind now this um, the moment that we can point to as saying it, it, this is kind of the birth of the modern women's rights movement would be the seneca falls convention of 1848 so seneca falls is in new york state and there was this big meeting there in 1848 and they draw up at this meeting something called the declaration of sentiments which was modeled on the declaration of independence but said uh, very explicitly that all men and women are created equal they go on to demand suffrage rights for women and this is something again we can point to in retrospect and say this is kind of the birth of the modern women's rights movement now this image here of the um of the seneca falls convention is interesting um, because you have all these women down here on the floor talking and some men as well um, what's interesting if you look right here notice this woman right here she's wearing pants and that doesn't seem like a big deal to us in the modern day, but for women to wear pants instead of a dress was considered scandalous and considered bad form uh, for women. This, you know, women and men would be gossiping behind her back like, oh my gosh, I can't believe she's wearing pants. What is she thinking? Um, all right, so that is our look at um, the reform movements. We talked about um, prison reform the temperance movement, asylum reform, abolitionism, women's rights. I'm sure I'm leaving something out, but the point is the Second Great Awakening is really what's getting this going. Uh, this new um, sort of belief in, 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 in progress and in, in faith in humanity is causing people to really take a stand and say, let's change how we live. Let's make ourselves a better place.